it's 10 o'clock. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is McGregor Eddy. I'm with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Disarm Committee. And this is a program about the land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, a nuclear weapon delivery system. Currently, the United States uses a Minuteman III missile and it's proposed a replacement. And we're going to have a discussion of the meanings of these weapons, how they fit into current treaties, um, what we can do about them and what their implications are and the people that are affected by them. Our speakers today are going to be Cynthia Papermaster from Code Pink and Christian Sorensen, uh, author of The Merchants of, I'm sorry, War. I, did I get the name right? Tell me. Uh, Understanding the War Industry by, uh, I, from Clarity Press. I'm so sorry. I have it written in front of me and I got nervous. I apologize. Understanding the War Industry. Our third speaker is Jackie Cabasso from the Western States Legal Foundation and the person that coordinates the Mayors for Peace, a very inspiring organization. Uh, we're being, tech is being provided by Ellen Thomas of uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And this whole thing is dedicated to the leadership of Dan Ellsberg. And we're gonna start with him speaking about international, internet, National Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, and here is him speaking. Ellen, we'll run Dan now. Ellen, we're not getting any sound. It was supposed to work. I'm so sorry. Let me see if I can figure it out here. I've been having problems with my Jackie, if we make you a co-host, can you play it? Oh, here we go. I'm not sure whether it'll work or not, but give it a try again. Do you hear it? Yes. When I say that there is a step that could reduce the risk of nuclear war significantly, that has not been taken, but could easily be taken, and that that is the elimination of American ICBMs. We can hear it, but can't see it. The fact that there is only one weapon in our arsenal that confronts a president with the urgent decision of whether to launch nuclear war. And that is the decision to launch our ICBMs because they are vulnerable in a way that our submarine launch weapons at sea are not vulnerable and our planes can be called back. In fact, they don't even have to be called back. They can take off on positive control, it's called, and circle until they get a positive order to go ahead. We can do that for hours, actually, uh, delaying any decision as to what the situation is. 
That's not true for ICBMs. They are fixed location known to the Russians. And uh, the Russians have missiles, both sub and ICMs, as we do, that can destroy the ICBMs, the fixed location ICBMs. Should we have mutual elimination of ICBMs? Of course. But we don't need to wait for Russia to wake up to this reasoning that I'm getting here to do what we can to reduce the risk of nuclear war because it is the existence of ICBMs on both sides that keep both sides on high alert. To remove ours is to eliminate not only the chance that we will use our ICBMs wrongly, but it also deprives the Russians of the fear that our ICBMs are on the way toward them. You're muted, McGregor. That is only two and a half minutes and it's available on diffused nuclear war. So you can use it in a talk that you're giving to use that voice of experience and authority is on diffused nuclear war. There's several articles. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Cynthia. And if you want me to show the slides, I will do that. And you can tell the story of the people. Well, you can go ahead and show the slides if you if you want to. Okay. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very short story. McGregor put out the call that they were going to do a ICBM test at Vandenberg Air Force Base, and 15 of us answered the call. Um, she rented a green tortoise bus, and we got on the bus <laughs> and had a wonderful field trip down to Vandenberg Air Force Base. It was night. Um, the test launch was... I think around midnight, if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. um, yeah, uh, it was a it was a wonderful experience. Fifteen of us got out of the bus, or however we got there, and we lined up across the entrance to Vandenberg and started walking forward. Um, it we were very nervous. I mean, I'm speaking for myself now. I was very nervous. I had my dog with me, um, who went everywhere with me, Jiminy Winks. Anyway, as we proceeded forward, the military police kept backing up and it wasn't clear to us, you know, what exactly was going to happen, but eventually they did arrest all of us and booked us. And when they let us out, I think it was around three in the morning, we actually were able to see the test launch. Um, I'll never forget this. I'll never forget being with Dan. <laughs> There's a photo of us all. McGregor, if you could just stop for a second. Um, yeah, I am. I was trying to get forward to that, yes. All 15 of us are lined up there. Um, I'm on the left in my pink scarf, and you can see uh, Father Louis Vitali, Cindy Sheehan's right there, um, Dan Ellsberg next to him, Carolee Krieger, and David Krieger, um, Judy Talligan, and in the back of her is Toby Blomay, also from the Bay Area. Um, I don't I'm not sure exactly who the others are. Oh, Nicola Tor Torvid is there from Oakland, Webb Neely. Um, it was an amazing experience and they did charge us with trespassing. We all gathered um, uh, a few, there's Louis Vitale. Yes, we all gathered for the trial. And then about an hour before the trial was to begin, we found out that the federal prosecutors were dropping the charges. So, um, Unfortunately, we were not able to present our necessity defense, saying that it was necessary for us to do what we did in order to prevent uh, harm to the world. Thank you, McGregor, for giving me this opportunity to relive the experience at Vandenberg. Just amazing. Stop share. And I just wanted, because this is not about, this is just to give you a little background of as we move on to Christian, that this is a story of people, the people who protested it, the people who live in the area that can't, it's built on Chumash land. The missile goes off, it arcs over the Pacific, over Hawaii, where there's a tracking station on Kauai. And then it arcs to the Marshall Islands. 
where although it's a dummy warhead that doesn't do particular harm, it's still using the Marshall Islands as a target after all the injury that we've done to them. So now, Christian, we've sent the background of our current Minuteman 3. Tell us about what's coming. Well, thank you for having me. This is a, uh, this is a real treat. So the Sentinel Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, ICBM. You know the nuclear triad. The nuclear triad, three parts, clearly. One part, the submarines that can launch ballistic missiles, nuclear weapons. The second part is aircraft that can drop nuclear bombs. And the third, which we we're talking about today, is the land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, nuclear weapons. These are the big six. Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, L3 Harris. Northrop Grumman is, as you will see, leading the group of corporations that is developing the new Sentinel ICBM. Northrop Grumman is making the first and the second stage. These are the first rocket booster and the second rocket booster. A corporation called Aerojet Rocketdyne is building the third. It is doing so in Huntsville, Alabama and Camden, Arkansas. Northrop Grumman is working on its boosters in northern Utah, Colorado Springs, Colorado, and of course, Huntsville, Alabama. So these three rockets power the missile during the first three minutes of flight, basically getting it to its peak. After which, the reentry vehicle, which houses the warhead, follow the trajectory back down to the target. The reentry vehicle, as I said, holds the nuclear warhead. Lockheed Martin and Textron are working on this. Lockheed Martin's doing most of its work in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, that is on the outskirts of Philadelphia. Textron is working on its technology just north of Fort Worth, a town called Haslett. So the nuclear warhead is being designed and fabricated at the Department of Energy's nuclear labs. These labs are run by corporations, very important. This entire enterprise, this entire new Northrop Grumman ICBM is a corporate product, okay? The Department of Energy oversees and evaluates the nuclear labs, but the corporations run it. So you have Los Alamos in New Mexico, which is run by a group of Patel, Texas A&M, and University of California system. The Savannah River site in South Carolina is run by Floor. Huntington Ingalls Industries, and Honeywell, all together. Lawrence Livermore, up in California, run by Bechtel, Battelle, BWXT, Amentum, University of California, again, and Texas A&M, again. And lastly, down in at Sandia in New Mexico, the lab there is run by Honeywell, or a subsidiary of Honeywell. Honeywell is a top, top 10, top 12 uh, weapons contractor, war corporation. Other corporations are involved. CAE, Honeywell, which I mentioned, you will crop up again. General Dynamics and Raytheon Technologies. Raytheon Technologies Collins Aerospace Division is working on the command and control equipment that aircraft can use in a nuclear disaster to launch these from the air. General Dynamics is making the ground control command and launch equipment. Honeywell is working on the guidance and the electronics for the missile. CAE is working on the training programs for the Air Force. And numerous construction corporations are building and upgrading the silos and the ground control centers at the Air Force bases across the upper Midwest that house these weapons of mass destruction. Estimated cost. Northrop Grumman got $13.3 billion for itself and its subcontractors just on this initial contract just to get it up and running. 
Full acquisition and deployment is anticipated to be 96 to $100 billion. 96 to $100 billion. We as humans, no human, can fathom how much money this is. This is an unbelievable amount of money. Total life cycle through, I think it's uh, 2070, the year 2070, will be estimated $263 billion. That's at a minimum. And that's as if there are no delays, no cost overruns. That's if everything runs smoothly. And what we know about large war corporations, when they're involved in a huge enterprise like this, there is always cost overruns. There are always cost overruns. There are always delays. In fiscal year 2021, the U.S. government funneled $22.4 billion just in that fiscal year toward nuclear weaponry. Now, what might have those billions been used for? What might? That could have paid for 200,000 new nurses, okay? Or 2.6 million public housing units, or nearly 600,000 four-year university scholarships, or 130,000 jobs in sustainable energy. These are the, the, this is what we give up when we allow the US ruling class to go forward with the design and deployment of new nuclear weapons. This is what we are giving up. No universal healthcare, poor education, costly education. It's all tied together. Dismal infrastructure in this country. It regularly comes in at a D plus or a C minus. This is why the military industrial complex funnels resources to war and espionage and away from programs of social uplift. So who's responsible for this? Ultimately, we the people are. We, the 99%, allow the 1% to do this. We allow this to happen. Now, of course, there are people who, shall we say, deserve more blame than others. The 1%. Top Air Force officers, four-star generals. You can see a few here on the screen. Top corporate executives who are involved in this entire thing, of course. And that includes the lawyers, top legal teams at these corporations. The legal teams provide one of the many shields that these entities use. Beware public relations. Beware public relations. Public relations is just corporations lying to the American public. That's just a strategic deterrent. It's not a nuclear weapon. No, no, no. It's a strategic deterrent. Sounds nice. This is a euphemism. We're just modernizing. We're just modernizing our, our arsenal. What could be, who could have any problem with that? It's just modernization. Another word they use is solution. You'll see this. Every single war corporation uses this. Every single one. Go to their website. Pick a random war corporation. Go to its website. You will see the word solution. It's not a weapon of mass destruction. It's not a good or service provided by the war industry. It is not whatever it is. It is a solution. And on and on and on. So I conclude with the following. The U.S. military industrial complex obviously hurts the workers of the world, the people of the world. Okay? People on the receiving end of our destruction. Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, Syria, Philippines, on and on and on, obviously, okay? However, the military industrial complex also hurts the working class here in the United States. How does it do this? Here are three ways of many. Number one, as we mentioned, the hundreds of billions of dollars every year funneled toward war instead could instead go to helping the public. Healthcare, infrastructure, education, international scientific cooperation. Those could be our priorities as a nation. Number two, the military industrial complex comes before the wars, not in response to them. 
Who fights the wars? Do the top corporate executives making eight figures a year sitting in Northern Virginia or Southern Maryland, do they fight the wars? No. Does a fat cat sitting on Wall Street fight the wars? Nope. Does a filthy rich private equity magnate who's investing in war corporations, does that person fight the wars? No. Does a four-star general sitting in the Pentagon fight the wars? Sitting in air-conditioned luxury with teams of sycophants catering to their every need. Do they fight the wars? No. Who fights the wars? The poor and working class in the United States are tricked or economically coerced into fighting the wars. Number three, the military industrial complex's massive espionage apparatus commonly known as the surveillance state, spies on the working class here in the United States. And intelligence agencies stifle any movement of change. Did that in the 60s and early 70s. The last time the public had a massive awakening of consciousness. Did it again, Occupy Wall Street was also crushed. Did it again, summer 2020 protests for civil rights, also crushed. I leave you with that. Thank you for your time. I'll answer any questions at the end. And let me stop sharing my screen. And this is going to be a good discussion. And um, Jackie, can you? Um, Jackie is the director of the Western States Legal Foundation. And she is the person who personally, she and Andy Lickerman, made me realize that these tests were being conducted at Vandenberg. When I first started protesting there, it was a place to protest the war on Iraq because the war is uh, directed from satellites that are put up in rockets from Vandenberg. I didn't know about the ICBM tests. They're kind of routine. It's like these big rocket launches were the stuff. And as I started going there, it was Andy Lichterman and Jackie Cabasso who showed me the full range of what is done and how they're part of the nuclear weapons delivery system triad. And I think it's important because it's in a place we can see. When I talk to young people about nuclear weapons, it's almost mythical to them. They say that's a cause of the older. And at Vandenberg, you can see it go up. So I want to introduce Jackie Cabasso, who helped open my eyes. Uh, thank you, McGregor. And I was just recalling that the first time I was arrested there was 1983 <laughs> and many times subsequently. Um, and yes, yeah, seeing one of those tests is absolutely um, terrifying. I mean, that's not even a, a a strong enough word, but but you try your mind tries to conceive of what this means. So let me give some more background here. So you've just heard about the vast amount of money being poured into the new Sentinel land-based ICBM program, which is only part of a much larger program to modernize and upgrade US nuclear warheads and delivery systems for the foreseeable future, and is only a drop in the bucket of a near historically high US military budget. You've also heard about how military contractors are raking in profits from the Sentinel program. And yes, this is part of the reason the program is going forward, but it's not the only reason. I wanna take a step back, look at the bigger picture and explore some of the other reasons nuclear weapons not only continue to exist, but to play a central, and in some cases, increasingly central role in the national security policies of the United States and the world's other major powers. The Sentinel is an integral part of this doomsday machine, as Dan Ellsberg calls it. Let me start with a quote by Joseph Schumpeter, an Austrian political economist working during the first half of the 20th century. Quote, the budget is the skeleton of the state, stripped of all misleading ideologies, end quote. Militarism and the military budget are about more than just military spending and guns versus butter. We also need to assess the purposes and interests that militarism serves for those at the top and to recognize how eternal war preparedness underscores a culture of violence that runs from the top to the bottom of our society. 
U.S. national security policy has been remarkably consistent in the post-World War II and post-Cold War eras, despite dramatically changed geopolitical conditions and very different presidential styles. Deterrence, quote unquote, deterrence, the threatened use of nuclear weapons has been reaffirmed as the cornerstone of U.S. national security by every president, Republican or Democrat, including Clinton, Obama, and Biden, since 1945, when President Harry Truman, a Democrat, oversaw the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Unfortunately, since the end of the Cold War, Russia and other would-be superpowers have increasingly modeled their own national security policies as well as their economies on the U.S. model. In his famous Prague speech in 2009, President Obama declared, quote, to put an end to Cold War thinking, we will reduce the role of nuclear weapons in our national security strategy and urge others to do the same, end quote. But this was immediately followed by, quote, make no mistake, as long as these weapons exist, the United States will maintain a safe, secure, and effective arsenal to deter any adversary and guarantee that defense to our allies, end quote. So what exactly is this deterrent? What does deterrence mean? A typical understanding of Cold War deterrence meant maintaining the capacity to inflict a devastating retaliatory second strike or mutually assured destruction if either the United States or the Soviet Union attacked the other with nuclear weapons. But what did it really mean? Today, deterrence encompasses the entire military industrial complex and the national security state and elites that it serves not only in the United States. Deterrence is an ideology which has outlived its Cold War origins and is used by nuclear armed states to justify the perpetual possession and threatened use, including first use of nuclear weapons. I'm sorry to say that while nuclear weapons are useless for the vast majority of humankind, they are not useless to the most powerful ruling elites. Deterrence goes well beyond the threat of retaliation. As stated in a 2008 Department of Defense report on the Air Force's nuclear mission, quote, nuclear deterrence is achieved by credibly threatening a potential adversary with the use of nuclear weapons so as to prevent that adversary from taking actions against the United States, its allies, or its vital interests. This is accomplished primarily by maintaining sufficient and effective nuclear capabilities to pose unacceptable costs and risks upon the adversary should it so act. And quote, though our consistent goal has been to avoid actual weapons use, the nuclear deterrent is used every day by assuring friends and allies, dissuading opponents from seeking peer capabilities to the United States, deterring attacks on the United States and its allies from potential adversaries, and providing the potential to de defeat adversaries if deterrence fails, end quote. As another U.S. military planning document put it, nuclear weapons provide, quote, a credible deterrent umbrella under which conventional forces operate, and if deterrence fails, strike a wide variety of high-value targets with highly reliable, responsive, and lethal nuclear force. Desired effects include freedom for U.S. and allied forces to operate, employ, and engage at will, end quote. In fact, nuclear weapons are already being used by Russia, the U.S., and NATO to provide top cover for the conventional military operations. Last year, Admiral Charles Richard, then head of U.S. Strategic Command in charge of nuclear war planning, wrote, quote, We must acknowledge the foundational nature of our nation's strategic nuclear forces as they create the maneuver space for us to project conventional military power strategically, end quote. We are clearly seeing this concept being played out by Russia in the Ukraine war. We're living in a time of extraordinary nuclear dangers. All of the nuclear armed states are modernizing their nuclear arsenals. With Russia's illegal war of aggression in Ukraine, which could eventually draw the militaries of the US, its NATO allies and Russia into direct conflict, Exacerbated by Russia's repeated threats to use nuclear weapons, the specter of nuclear war has risen to its highest level since the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Other festering nuclear flashpoints include Taiwan, the Korean Peninsula, South Asia, and the Middle East. The scale and tempo of war games by nuclear armed states and their allies, including nuclear drills, are increasing. Ongoing missile tests, including 
ICBMs, and frequent close encounters between military forces of nuclear armed states exacerbate nuclear dangers. The policy of nuclear deterrence is not passive and it's not benign. So how do we get here? Well, in the 1980s, the palpable fear of nuclear war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union was at the top of most people's minds in the U.S. and around the world. But following the end of the Cold War, nuclear weapons fell off the public's radar screen. It was almost as if the planet itself breathed a huge sigh of relief. People around the world hoped and believed that they had escaped a nuclear holocaust and largely put nuclear weapons out of their minds. Most people believed that the threat of nuclear war had ended but it hadn't. To the contrary, deeply embedded in the US military industrial complex, military planners and scientists at the nuclear weapons labs conjured up new justifications to sustain the nuclear weapons enterprise. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, in 1991, Colin Powell, then chair of the US Joint Chiefs of Staff declared, quote, we no longer have the luxury of having a specific threat to plan for. What we plan for is that we're a superpower. We are the major player on the world stage with responsibilities and interests around the world, end quote. Other would-be superpowers were paying attention and looking out for their own interests. A 2010 White House fact sheet entitled An Enduring Commitment to the U.S. Nuclear Deterrent announced the Obama administration's plans, quote, to invest more than $85 billion over the next decade to modernize the U.S. nuclear weapons complex that supports our deterrent. This level of funding is unprecedented since the end of the Cold War, end quote. And this didn't include an additional $100 billion by 2020 to modernize the missiles and delivery systems that carry U.S. nuclear warheads. In testimony before the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Strategic Forces in 2011, Dr. James Miller, Principal Dep Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, increased the numbers, stating, quote, the administration's fiscal year 2012 budget reflects our commitment to the modernization of our nuclear arsenal for the long term, including some $125 billion over the next 10 years to sustain our strategic delivery systems and about $88 billion over the same period to sustain our nuclear arsenal and modernize infrastructure, end quote. This huge sum was the price exacted by the U.S. military industrial complex and its representatives in the Senate for Senate ratification of the START Treaty, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, in December 2010. The political conditions attached to Senate ratification in the U.S. and mirrored by the Russian Duma effectively turned START into an anti-disarmament measure. This was stated in so many words by Senator Bob Corker, a Republican senator from Tennessee, whose state is home to the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, site of a multi-billion dollar uranium processing facility now under construction. This is what he said, quote, I am proud that as a result of ratification, we have been successful in securing commitments from the administration on modernization of our nuclear arsenal and support of our missile defense programs, two things that would not have happened otherwise. In fact, thanks in part to the contributions my staff and I have been able to make, the New START Treaty could easily be called the Nuclear Modernization and Missile Defense Act of 2010, unquote. And I just want to say that it's kind of ironic that this is the, the last arms control treaty in existence between the United States and Russia, and Russia has now suspended it, uh, and everybody is wringing their hands. And it seems to me that it, this approach kind of planted the seeds of its own uh, demise, uh, but was uh, not, this critique was not um, welcome at the time, to say the least. In his February 2011 message to the Senate on the New START Treaty, President Obama certified, among other things, his intention to, quote, modernize or replace the triad of strategic nuclear delivery systems, a heavy bomber, an air-launched cruise missile, an ICBM, and a nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine and sea-launched ballistic missile. This was not an entirely new development. The deal for START ratification reprised and expanded the trade-off brokered by President Bill Clinton in the mid-1990s for Senate ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. In that case, although the Senate failed to ratify the treaty, the stockpile stewardship program was established and billions of dollars were poured into construction of massive new facilities for simulating nuclear test explosions 
and training new generations of nuclear weapons scientists. Research and development on new warheads and delivery systems continued, existing weapon types were modified and enhanced, and the continued power and political influence of the nuclear weapons laboratories, the direct descendants of the Manhattan Project, and the vast array of government agencies, corporations, and, uni and universities that comprise the nuclear weapons establishment was projected indefinitely into the future. The Biden administration's 2022 Nuclear Posture Review, or NPR, states, quote, for the foreseeable future, nuclear weapons will continue to provide unique deterrence effects that no other element of U.S. military power can replace, quote. To this end, the United States is committed to modernize its nuclear forces and production and support infrastructure. The Biden NPR retains all three legs of the strategic triad of delivery systems, the ground-based ICBMs, sea-launched ballistic missile submarines and strategic bombers, and describes plans to replace them all with upgraded models accompanied by a suite of modernized warheads. It also states, quote, as long as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear, a nuclear alliance, end quote. The 2022 NPR identifies Russia in the near term and China in the longer term as posing growing nuclear threats to the United States, its allies and partners. The NPR states, quote, by the 2030s, the United States will, for the first time in history, face two major nuclear powers as strategic competitors and potential adversaries, end quote. So what is to be done? In March, the White House released its proposed budget for fiscal year 2024. The $1.6 trillion discretionary spending request includes $886 billion for the military, near historical levels, and is $28 billion higher than what Congress approved for regular military and nuclear weapons operations in 2023. More than half of the proposed discretionary spending is for the military and war. Only one in three federal discretionary dollars under the Biden budget would be available for human needs and community programs like affordable housing programs, public education, and public health. On March 28, 2023, in a statement before the House Armed Services Committee Strategic Forces Subcommittee, Dr. John Plum, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Sp Space Policy said, quote, the president's budget request fully funds implementation of the 2022 Nuclear Post Review, requ requesting $37.7 billion to recapitalize, sustain, and operate the Department of Defense nuclear enterprise. This includes full funding for modernization of the nuclear triad, including the Sentinel Intercontinental Ballistic Missile System, the Columbia-class nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarine, the B-21 bomber, modernization of the aging B-52 bomber, the long-range standoff cruise missile, and life extension programs for the Trident II submarine-launched ballistic missile. The President's F fiscal year 2024 request of $37.7 billion is $3 billion more than the fiscal year 2023 request. And he concludes, quote, sustained congressional support for this monumental generational effort is critical to ensuring that the United States will maintain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent and strong and credible extended deterrence, end quote. Even if the current Ukraine crisis brings no wider war, the end of hostilities will bring a world much changed. The response from those who rule in all the most powerful states likely will be more arms racing. A campaign for more arms spending and forward deployment of military forces already is underway in the United States and Europe. This will only harden the confrontation between the governments of the U.S. and NATO, not only with that of Russia, but with the government of China, increasing the risk of war among nuclear armed countries. For decades, we've seen deepening inequality and injustice at home and intensifying confrontations ahead. Throwing more state violence at social and political problems has an unbroken record of failure. It's time to seek a different path. It seems unlikely to me that we'll be successful in picking off one leg of the strategic triad, or for that matter, eliminating nuclear weapons altogether without what Martin Luther King called for exactly one year before his tragic assassination, quote, a radical revolution in values. By doubling down on the concept of national security through military might at any cost, 
The governments of the nuclear armed states and their allies are putting humanity on the road to Armageddon. People everywhere, together, need to rise up nonviolently and demand implementation of a different concept of security based on cooperation among governments to make meeting human needs and protecting the environment their highest priority. As Mahatma Gandhi observed, quote, the moral to be legitimately drawn from the supreme tragedy of the bomb is that it will not be destroyed by counter bombs, even as violence cannot be by counter violence. Mankind has to get out of violence only through nonviolence. Hatred can be overcome only by love. Counter hatred only increases the surface as well as the depth of hatred. And he explained how social transformation will come from the bottom up. Quote, we have to make truth and nonviolence not matters for mere individual practice, but for practice by groups and communities and nations. Before general disarmament commences, some nation will have to dare to disarm herself and take large risks. The level of nonviolence in that nation, if that event happily comes to pass, will naturally have risen so high as to command universal respect. Her judgment will be unerring, her decisions firm, her capacity for heroic self-sacrifice will be great, and she will want to live as much for other nations as for herself, which is a concept called common security. I will stop there. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Christian. Um, thank you, Cynthia. Um, I want to open it for questions and I want to ask a question because I have always not wanted just to attack one leg of the triad, but go after the whole thing. But listening to Dan Ellsberg talk specifically about the land based, I think that for people, when I'm talking to someone not interesting, it's easier to understand a part of it because people feel overwhelmed. I'm not just making this up. This is from people I've talked to about it. They think it's too big and too complicated. And if you can start by talking about a piece of it that is comprehensible and the people feel they can look at that, they'll question the rest. So I am proposing that we launch a specific campaign to stop the Sentinel because it exposes the lobbying is so egregious in this case. It's so, so extreme that the military didn't even want these and we're getting one. Is it, it just heightens it. And I was thinking, I'm just discouraged with trying to talk to people about nuclear weapons. They've got a lot of problems and they don't want to hear about it. I just open to ideas. Do you think, see, in the past, we have focused. In the 80s, we focused on the MX missile, remember? There was a whole other program. The, in Canada, they're, fight, they're fight, focusing on the F-35 jet even though there's a whole, do you think it's sensible to try to focus on one thing that we might be able to stop and use it as a springboard to educate other people? Well, I, I'll take a crack at answering that, McGregor. Um, I have no problem with using it as a starting point for educating people. Thinking of it as a, as a winnable approach I think it's just not realistic. The world has changed quite a bit since the 1980s. We don't have mass movements. We've had continuous wars. We've had continuous, I mean, what more dramatic could have happened than the end of the Cold War, the dissolution of the Soviet Union? And here we are, because this, this juggernaut is so powerful that it goes forward, Despite history, it just goes forward. So what I was trying to present was the idea that we have to somehow come to grips with the magnitude of the forces that we are up against, which are, I believe, beyond economic. That's part of it, but that's not all of it. And so what I'm proposing is 
what the Poor People's Campaign calls moral fusion organizing, which is where we organize around common values so that we all have each other's backs. And some of us will be working on eliminating the the sentinel. Others will be working on universal health care. Others will be working on women's reproductive rights, whatever it is. The, the Poor People's Cam has, I don't know if, if people are familiar with it, but the Poor People's Campaign has picked up Martin Luther King's unfinished work where in which he identified the triple evils of racism, poverty, and militarism. They've added uh, environmental devastation and the distorted Christian nationalist narrative, moral narrative that blames poor people for their own poverty and claims there's not enough. They see those two things are indivisible and they, are, they form components of a, of a moral fusion campaign. And that can, the, in the Poor People's Campaign moral budget, moral jubilee pro, uh, platform, they call for cutting the military budget by half. They call for eliminating nuclear weapons. So it's part and parcel of the package. Now, I'm saying that this is a, an approach that I think has is attractive and has potential because we're working side by side with people we normally never would be working side by side with. When you're involved in poor people's campaign events, you're you're dealing with people from all walks of life, all races, all parts of the country, uh, all economic levels, and poor people and directly impacted people's voices are centered in that. So, you know, that's the direction I think we need to be going. And I think that we 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 have to look at the world with with fresh eyes and, and look, you know, we had the 80s and the 80s, I mean, we had this massive anti-nuclear movement. The Soviet Union disappeared, but we couldn't stop it. So there has to be something even deeper that we have to stop. Cynthia? Unmute yourself. I think I'm unmuted now. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. Um, yeah, I absolutely support the Poor People's Campaign, and I see the potential there for uh, building an even larger movement um, uh, by empowering people who, you know, are normally left out of the decision-making process because there are more of us. And I like to think about the Occupy movement. Christian brought up the Occupy movement. We haven't gone anywhere. Um, it was all over the United States in every town. Um, it it did get, um, I think it got infiltrated. I think it got crushed uh, by the surveillance state. But regardless, um, the messages that it had resonated with people everywhere, that we are the 99%. The other thing I wanted to bring up, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying that that potential exists of reactivating um, the energy around the Occupy movement and combining that with the Poor People's Campaign. But the other thing is the worker issue, the labor issue. Um, I think we need very much, we need a different jobs program than the military program that we have now. The military program we have now, the war economy, employs so many people worldwide. Um, I look at Lockheed Martin, I look at how large they are, I look at how they are in every state of the union, um, Grumman's the same way, General Dynamics, Boeing, uh, they're all the same way. Uh, <laughs> what we need is to transition to a peace economy, What we this is what we say in Code Pink. And how do we transition to a peace economy? By allying with the climate movement, those are the twin existential threats the climate catastrophe, which faces us very urgently, very urgently. We don't have the luxury of, of talking about 10-year plans or 20-year plans any longer or election cycles, you know, endless election cycles where we could replace um, the corporate-owned politicians. So just to talk in the short term, because that's really the way we should be thinking is short-term planning. Um, we have to have some kind of campaign that invites labor, invites workers, invites poor people and low-income people, invites the whole Occupy, the whole 99%, and bring all of that together and unify. Now, what do we do with all that energy? Um, we The budget is a moral document. 
<laughs> look at our look at our U.S. budget. Um, it's and people know. I think you know people I talk to, regardless of who they are, they know that our spending priorities are wrong. So in some way, we have to unify all of these different elements together, um, and and take power as soon as possible. But we need labor with us. So I would love to hear Christian's response to to that. Thank you very much. I don't know if I have much to add. I would just say that uh, a federal jobs guarantee given to the working class within the military industrial complex. I'm not talking about the executives at the top. I'm not talking about Wall Street. They can go hang because they're the 1%. They're the ones causing, driving. The structure drives the whole thing, but they're the ones guiding the structure. So I would say if, as Cynthia mentioned, the good people of the world, the 99% were able to assume authority, a federal jobs guarantee for the workers, people who are, for example, the engineers, the mathematicians, the physicists, all the way down to the welder, all the way down to the person on the assembly line and at Raytheon in Tucson, Arizona, or a shipbuilder at General Dynamics Bath Iron Works up in Maine, across the board. And there's plenty of money to do that. There's plenty of money to do that, as we've seen with this budget. If the working class is given a federal jobs guarantee during the transition from the war economy into industries that actually help people, then that is the cornerstone of any transition. The workers will be on your side. And I'm not saying this is easy. I'm just saying that this is how, how it could be pulled off uh, if the good people of the world are uh, able to access authority within the next, well, less than a decade. And I would also tie this into the fact that the youth, not just in the United States, but worldwide are facing an unlivable planet as all of you have alluded to. So they don't have any time, they have no time left. And at some point, whether we like it or not, the youth are going to rise up. They are smart, they, know, they are well-educated, they know exactly what's going on. Eventually they're gonna rise up. So it is our job to do what we're doing here today, to put out uh, research, to work every single day, to educate one another and to make sure that we put out all this information into the internet so that the youth have access to it and yeah. are able to understand where things are located, where are the bases, where are the war corporate headquarters, where are the factories, what do the factories produce, what could they be producing instead, what are the inputs into those factories, the workers know all of that, and we will be able to, uh, to transition. And I would just conclude this little rant with, um, just say, we can stay optimistic. This can be done. This absolutely can be done. This is not a pie in the sky scheme. It can, um, things can change overnight. Things can change in a matter of days and weeks and things eventually will because there's too much coming down the pike in terms of environmental devastation, in terms of wealth gap, and in terms of a youth that are facing an a atrocious economic system that is capitalism, but also a, uh, an unlivable planet in their lifetime. So. <laughs> Thank Let's, you, Christian. Uh, yeah. Thank Let's you, Christian. Positive. Very clear. Very clear. I'm going to call on John Burroughs. Excellent. Mm -hmm. John? John Burroughs, you raised your hand. Diane? You raised. I'm trying to be a good moderator. Diane, you raised your hand. You have to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I must not understand how to do this. I apologize. Um, I don't know how to unmute you. I apologize. There, I got it. I got it. I'm going to bring this. I finally got it, Eddie. Uh, McGregor, I finally got it. Good. Thank I think you. I'm sorry, but I kept getting these messages saying I couldn't. But I wanted to say thank you. Uh, let me see if I can start my video, which I could not do before either. I get this it says is media alert. You cannot start your video because the host. Let's not waste time discussing it. We have I'm problems. Why anyway, people aren't. But anyway, I wanted to thank everybody. I thought it was so good. But uh, getting back to Christian's point about the youth. The problem is that I think it, it took me so long 
to learn everything, to learn about these difficulties. I mean, I grew up and I was, I thought the military was great. They protected us. It took me a long time. I mean, I, I, I thought I was educated. It's, it, it's only when I got in my, you know, recently, it, it, you know, for so many years, I was okay with everything. And I'm sorry, but I don't know about these youth knowing about the nuclear war and the dangers and everything. And also, I think that Christian, that you perhaps took a while to learn about all this, because I see you were Air Force person too. Um, so, so I'm, get, I'm questioning this youth thing about them knowing about the nuclear problems. John, you should be clear now. Yes, so hello, uh, McGregor and everybody. It's uh, great to see you in action, uh, McGregor. Uh, it's a very good question you posed, McGregor, about is it a good idea to focus on the new uh, ICBM? And, you know, uh, Dan Ellsberg has given us sort of a strategic reasons why it's worthwhile focusing on uh, the, uh, the new ICBM. But I think there's a, a different reason why it could be a good idea. And that is that the arsenal is diverse. Uh, as Jackie said, all elements of it are undergoing uh, upgrades or uh, just just to give one example, there is an air-launched uh, cruise missile. Uh, that means a cruise missile launched from uh, an airplane, <laughs> and it's it's actually a very um, dangerous kind of weapon because it can be used in an offensive or first strike kind of way, uh, and there is. Uh, a um, drive, these things take years to replace that air launched uh, cruise missile. Uh, but that's just an example. There's upgrades or replacements going on across the nuclear arsenal. Uh, the thing about the land-based missiles, the ICBMs, is they're readily understandable. They're, they're visible to people and also they're really important uh, in terms of the overall US uh, nuclear uh, posture, shall we, shall we say. Uh, but if there's a focus on a particular system, you know, it needs to be, I think, in the context uh, of a larger vision of what role the US should play in the in the world what foreign policy it should have in all the all the things that uh, 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 Jackie and Cynthia and Christian were, were were talking about but you know on balance I think it's probably a good idea to kind of foreground at least uh, the, the the new ICBM the so-called sent Sentinel Peter, can you speak? Peter Persley, can you speak? Uh, we're having troubles, I apologize. If you put your, Peter, if you type your question in the chat, I will read it, I promise. I wanted to ask another question because I respect this okay. audience. Did I get Peter, a, did I get a mute? Speak. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, I, yeah, I haven't been able to uh, uh, speak or write. The chat is also dysfunctional. But let me follow up by saying, uh, I just want to second what John Burroughs has said about focusing on land-based missiles. I think it's a it's a concrete topic. It's a limited topic, but I think it's a viable topic for us to focus on. The other thing I just wanted to say very briefly is that we've got to come up with a strategy to deal with our national politics. Uh, the Congress, I mean, we, we do have Barbara Lee's uh, $100 billion proposal uh, for a cut in the defense budget, but that just means $100 billion less 
for continuing everything that we're doing. It's something, uh, but it's certainly nowhere near what we need to be talking about. Uh, so I would just encourage us all uh, to think about what can we do at the Chicago a Democratic Convention, uh, if anything. Uh, you know, I think uh, back to the civil rights uh, movement and Fannie Lou Hamer uh, at a national convention. We have to come up with something along those lines. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Excellent, excellent presentation by all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, so much. I have another question I want to ask. There's going, to, I may take this, edit this out because it will make it timed and we want to use this to help educate people, but there is a intercontinental ballistic test launch scheduled from Vandenberg 72 hours from now. Uh, this is April 15th on April 19th. In March, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Department of Defense postponed an ICBM test from Vandenberg and put out wonderful uh, boilerplate uh, reasoning about being a responsible uh, nuclear power and that it would, in the interest of not being provocative or destabilizing, that they were postponing it because of the Russian invasion. Then three weeks later, they did it. In August, when Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan, the Department of Defense again postponed an ICBM test launch saying that international relations were too delicate and they were going to be a responsible nuclear power. I think that right now, to my ignorant view, it looks even more touchy, what with threatened nukes and uh, threatened tactical placements in Belarus and other things happening uh, with maneuvers in the world. So why are they not postponing this one? And here's the question, could we ask them to postpone it and quote their own language back at them? And McGregor, let me answer that one. Um, actually, uh, Peace Action has spearheaded a organizational sign-on letter making that demand. Uh, yeah. I believe at least 40 organizations have signed on to it, including Western States Legal Foundation. Um, yes. I believe that it, it closed for uh, signature yesterday. Um, but I want to say, like, to, to again, back on this point of focusing on the ICBMs, again, I think uh, I think highlighting the test launches is really important and useful now because we're getting so much media coverage of missile tests by other countries. Um, and people don't know that the United States is testing these missiles. And furthermore, every one of these tests by the United States or these other countries is an implied nuclear threat and that one that can be seen. So I think that aspect of it is is extremely relevant and important right now. Um, and I totally agree with you about calling for postponing these tests for the reasons that, that they have stated themselves. Yes. <laughs> yes, you're right. It is very provocative. So knock it off. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. When I go down, I'll issue that statement. I expect there to be three of us, which is a lot more than zero. If anyone wants to come, I'll take this. We'll edit this out because it's dated. But I, I will send you that letter when it's released. Make sure you have it. Okay, thanks. McGregor, could you say more about how we could gather at Vandenberg if you wanted okay. more? If you do want to go, the next launch and most launches occur a little bit before midnight. This one is set for 11.45 p.m. on April 19th, which is, interestingly enough, the back from the brink call-in day, which I find uh, back from the brink and then at the end of the day, an ICBM goes up. Um, there are protest advisories on the Vandenberg, their own website. They have a protest advisory. This has been litigated. They provide parking. It's at Vandenberg Middle School across the street. If you want to go there, use the map coordinates for Vandenberg Middle School, not for the base. 
go to the school. You may park at the school. You may call me. <laughs> I will give you my phone number if you're thinking of coming. So send me an email and I will give you my own phone number and give you some advice. But it is legal to protest there. You won't be arrested if you don't cross the line. At least I can't guarantee it. Sometimes they they don't like me. So sometimes uh uh could you put your little... could you put your email address and phone number in the chat? Sure. So I'll put my email, but not my phone number. No, I, okay. Hey, I got it. It's very easy. It's my, my first and last name at Gmail. No secrets. And are you planning on having a presence there? Uh, you asked if a certain person would be good to be a speaker. Are you planning on having a an event of some kind, a program? Well, um, I am hoping that someone else that I'm, there's two other people that might come. If they don't, I won't go out there because it's scary and it's dark. Uh, and um, I wish people would come. And here's what I most need. I need names of people who might come who live closer. <laughs> Anybody, Santa Barbara, Oxnard, Ventura, Ojai, uh, you name it. Even Los Angeles is closer. It's closer than me. So just think about people who might be moved by it, might think it important, might. It's a real place. It's Chumash land. It's a remarkable thing to be present for. And it's happening in our beautiful Southern California. All the, every, about every three months, there's one. So you're welcome to come. I'm planning to keep going. And I think that the fact that this is visible, when nobody goes, the media, had, they do cover the launches, but they have nothing to say except to repeat the, we're maintaining our safety of our deterrent nuclear deterrence, all the, the lies you talked about. But when we physically go there, the media will, when given something else to say, print it. But in order to do that, you got to go there. It's hard to do. It's night. I'm old. <laughs> Take plenty of fly flights. <laughs> so, if you say, Peter, would you say, Peter? Take plenty of fly flights. Oh, right. Oh, no. They, they have lights. Oh, oh, they have lights. Big lights. <laughs> um, just think about it. It's it's a, on your bucket list. If you've never been to an I, a test ICBM launch, you know you want to go see the elephant seals and you want to go see the the museum and you can go take in a go to over and see the uh, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta thing in Keene. Visit Southern California and see a launch. Participate in a peace thing. So think it over. And uh, any suggestions, final comments. I, we want to make this useful. So any final summing up comments and we'll close. I would like to make a plug for the War Industry Resistors Network, W-I-R-N. Uh, their website is hosted by Veterans for Peace. And uh, what we're doing is looking at the war industry in our local communities. I have Lockheed Martin nearby. Um, everybody, ha I'm sure, has the war industry in their local communities. But the idea isn't so much to protest. The idea is to connect with workers and to get their support for a transition to a peace economy, however that can be done. Thank you. Cynthia does excellent work with that. And I want to thank Christian for mentioning where all these things are made because we are trying to expose this, this among us. So I want to thank Jackie for your inspiring and comprehensive overview of the whole situation. I want to thank Cynthia for her passion and her dedication and Ellen for your backup. And I hope to we will continue to work. We'll continue as Sisyphus did, push the ball up the hill. And I peace to you all. And I thank you very much for joining us. And I, we will make this available on YouTube 
with maybe a little editing. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The recording stopped. Anyone want to say anything tactless? <laughs> I've turned off the recording. <laughs> I just thought I'd let you know. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Jackie and Christian. That's so excellent. It fit together nicely, thank you. So I'm going to say goodbye. <laughs>